I first met our next speaker and his lovely, lovely wife, Penny, uh, when I went out to Claremont many years ago uh, to graduate school. He was the president at the time of the Claremont Institute. And uh, what I quickly learned about him is that, uh, uh, you know, he's a teacher. It's something that Hillsdale students uh, learn about him today. He's a teacher. He's always teaching. Uh, he didn't teach formal classes back then, as he does now. Uh, but we graduate students certainly learned a lot from him. And he always took the time to talk to us when we had uh, questions. Uh, back in those days when we were younger and sillier, we used to kid him that he was a college professor trapped in a think tank president's body. Um, now I guess he's a college professor in a college president's body. Um, well, if you come to see us on the Hillsdale campus, uh, and we hope you do, you'll see that he hasn't changed a bit. He's still teaching, and he's now offering formal classes on a variety of subjects. Uh, those subjects include Aristotle, the Constitution, and C.S. Lewis. And just last fall, he taught a course on totalitarian novels. Some of you may have seen his essay in the December 2020 issue of Imprimus, where he discussed one of those novels, George Orwell's 1984. Well, he's still pushing his students to defend their opinions, as he did with us, and think them through uh, more, more clearly and deeply, uh, because the goal of an education uh, worthy of the name is discovering the truth about things. Uh, and that's not easy. Well, it's been my privilege and honor to work with him uh, at Hillsdale, my alma mater, for now uh, more than 20 years. Uh, please welcome him back to the podium, the 12th president of Hillsdale College, Larry P. Arn. Thank you, Jim. How are you? So I want to begin with two personal things. Uh, one is show the picture. <laughs> now, we're not behind in our capital campaign, but if we were, I would auction that baby off right now. <laughs> Except my wife sits back there and she told me I mustn't. That's Charlotte Teresa. And everybody thinks she's just like her grandfather. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That's enough of her. Nobody wants to look at me. Um, I want to tell you some stories about Rush Limbaugh. Uh, because I've led a weird life, for different reasons, I've known uh, Mark Levin and Hugh Hewitt since a long time before they got into radio. And I've met Rush Limbaugh for the first time in 1984, the year his, his career was just taking off. He was in Sacramento, California, and I had business up there. I'd go, and the cab drivers were all listening to him and talking about how great he was. And then I ran across him in a hotel, and I walked up and shook his hand. And I said, you're dynamite. And he said, well, yes, I am. Uh, I knew him off and on. Well, I've, you know, I've known him. That's 36 years ago. Uh, he uh, would come and speak for things for, that I was hosting at the Claremont Institute and here. And uh, I found out about him. So I, got, I know him personally pretty well. He's shy. Can you believe that? He's very shy. And uh, he once came to Washington, D.C. to speak at a dinner where Newt Gingrich was speaking. And he asked us to drape off a little area behind the stage where he could drink Diet Coke and wait to give his speech. And he, he sat back there, and there were like 600 people there. And I walked back there, and I said, Rush, there's 600 people out there who would just love to see you. Why don't you come have some dinner? He said, no, I'm drinking my Diet Coke. And he gave his speech, and he walked back in that room, and he went to his airplane, and he went home. And I, I said, uh, next time I saw him, I said, you're a really weird guy. <laughs> and he said, I am, am I not? Uh, he got to talking about the college. And this was, you know, when? This was 12 years ago. And he, something about, him, about it, you know, he liked the college and he knew a lot about it, but he it struck his fancy. And we got this huge response. Every time he'd mention this on the radio, the phones would uh, get jammed up. And then he, he called one day, and he said, I want you to advertise on my show. 
And you know, he had a big wait list of people to advertise on his show, so, and I happened to know that. So I knew it was a kind of an honor, but I thought it was an odd idea. Let's advertise a college on the Rush Limbaugh show. And I said, okay, I'll think about it. And then he sent Craig Kitchen, who's his number one producer, will be grieving today, out to Hillsdale twice. And both times, he sat all afternoon through an Aristotle class. <laughs> He said, I was teaching it. He said, I want to get a sense of what this college is about. And I said, okay, well, come with me. And he just, you know, he, he, I thought that was a remarkable demonstration of patience on the man. <laughs> and you know, I didn't do anything about it. And then uh, in this first week that Obama was elected president, he said to a bunch of people, you've got to stop listening to Rush Limbaugh. And so I came to the Monday morning staff meeting and I said, uh, we're going to examine this week whether to advertise on Rush Limbaugh. And uh, John Savini back there said, so the president made you mad, didn't he? And I said, yeah, because, you know, that's the specific thing that the president of the United States is supposed to protect. Us listening to and saying what we want to, right? It's our rights. And he's an agent of those rights, except not. And that did tick me off. And that's why we decided to do that. And then, of course, it went wild. Uh, over the years, I would uh, go see him once a year down in Palm Beach. Uh, he lived right on the coast in Palm Beach, but the, as you, if you've ever been there, you know it's a very precious place. And uh, they wouldn't let him do his pro radio program out of his house. Violated the zoning. So about five blocks away, sort of in the more, er, more office area, he bought a three-story building, four-story building, and kept it empty. He was the only one in it. And uh, you'd go see him, and uh, you'd arrive always on Friday as he was finishing his show, 3.30, I think. And uh, you go up, and you go through, you know, there, were, there weren't very many people there. There were like three people helping him do the show, and Craig Kitchen was always there. And we would sit and talk for an hour. And it was just a hoot. And uh, he would always make fun of me the next Monday. Uh, so one day he said, the best conversation, he said, uh, what do you want me to say about the college? And I said, I want you to say it's hard. And he said, hard? And he looked at Craig Kitchen. He said, you know, we've been in radio for 40 years. Anybody ever ask us to say that before? And I said, yeah, say it's hard. And he said, how hard is it? And I said, what's well, hard? He said, how many people get above a four point? And I said, we don't do that. And he said, uh, how many get a four point? And I said, at that time it was seven. He said, seven, that's not many. I said, Rush, seven in 15 years. <laughs> and he says, you know, we've got great inflation now. That's up to like 20. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, we had two in one year the other day. We all felt, uh, a couple of years ago, we all felt ashamed of ourselves. <laughs> and he said, well, why don't they get it a four point? Is it chemistry? And I said, yeah, chemistry's hard. Everybody has to take that. Physics, biology, math, everybody has to take all that. And I said, probably the hardest department to get an A in is the English department, and if not that, politics. He said, English and politics are hard. I said, well, Russia, if you want to understand them, you know, we don't, we don't give out many A's. The average kid coming to Hillsdale College has a 3.92 from high school, and the average freshman gets a 2.87. <laughs> we call that chart, going across the years, shock and awe. <laughs> And, you know, we recruit by frightening them to death. We show them that chart and the recruiting, you know, because they're all used to making A's. And they've got to, they've got to lose that. They've got to not identify their self-esteem with making A's. And, you know, we always have a bunch that make 3.94. You know, there's a lot of them. But uh, we don't like them getting all A's all the way through. So the next, uh, and he said, Tell me how you make the Constitution course hard. And I said, Rush, the Constitution of the United States is, according to James Madison, a picture of the human soul, also a picture of the order of nature. And 
He starts out, when he talks about it early in the Federalist Papers, it's like a, uh, a mechanism. Cancel us out, right? So nobody gets to dominate and pursue their own interest. But it changes as it goes, and it becomes simply beautiful. And I, I quoted those passages to him in the 49th and 51st Federalist. So then the next Monday, you know, he's supposed to talk about us for, I don't know how long, a minute or something. And he very often went five minutes, six minutes, very long time in radio. This next Monday, he went 20 minutes. And he just told all about that conversation. And he said at the end, he said, uh, for the first time in my life, I wish I had gone to college. And I'm going to go visit Hillsdale College, which he never did. But on the other hand, we were forever. I mean, how many times has our call center answered the, question, answered the question, when is Rush Limbaugh coming? So he was a, he was a very bright man. He, uh, whatever, he, he said to me once, he said, uh, how do you manage a college? And I have some opinions about how you manage things, mostly from Churchill. Uh, the safeguard and the glory of mankind is that it is easy to lead and hard to drive. So you don't want to hire anybody to do anything they don't want to do. And you don't want to hire anybody who doesn't understand the goals. You don't, don't want to hire anybody who isn't honest. And then after that, let them do their work and help them when you need to. Once in a while, tell them no, but not often. So I told him that. And uh, then he said to me, he said, OK. He said, uh, at the end of that conversation, I was about to leave, he said, would you suggest some things that I should say? And I said, Rush, you haven't been listening to me. <laughs> and he said, uh, how not? And I said, are you the best at this? And he said, uh, yeah. I said, haven't I just told you what I hope you can help people understand? He said, yeah. I said, probably you should figure out how to do that, huh? <laughs> He's a... Uh, very interesting guy, very, uh, he worked. You know, he was rich as Croesus. I don't know what he's doing with the money. I hope he gives it to us, but, um, <laughs> but he has, you know, he has a family and he grew up 50 miles from where I grew up. We played on the same ba baseball field in Little League a couple times, not at the same time. Uh, and uh, he, he didn't have to work. He just loved to work. And he worked uh, probably 12 hours a day, three doing the show, nine getting ready. And he studied, and he, he, he would text me and ask me questions about things going on. Anyway, he was a great man. And uh, you know, in this day and age, of course, he's been being painted in the darkest colors in the press. Uh, another thing is, uh, Rush was hilarious. He could be really serious, but then mostly it was just hilarious. Did you ever hear, uh, I didn't listen to his show very much. I talked to him more than I listened to his show, but uh, I listened sometimes. Once it was a, became a famous one. He was talking about uh, his life in his apartment complex in New York before he moved to Palm Beach. And he said he'd, uh, he'd go there and he'd, uh, He'd settle down for a long evening's work, and he'd order takeout from like five places. He lost a lot of weight before he died. I mean, he, years before he died, but uh, he was kind of tubby. And uh, he said that it became very inconvenient because the uh, takeout guys were forbidden to come upstairs because they would go all over the apartment complex or the condo complex and put menus under everybody's door, and people thought that was tacky. Trump, uh, Rush didn't mind. So it's causing him, you know, because he says, you know, I'm in my boxer shorts and I got to put on my trousers and go down and get my food. That's just terrible. <laughs> Until one day I figured it out. <laughs> he called the, the uh, what do you call it, the porter. And he said, uh, would you please admit my dinner guest, my dinner guest, Raul? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I liked Rush. He, uh, you know, I, I can't even remember what it is now. And of course, that, that'll be, that's because I'm a racist, but, or something. But he, he did something that brought a storm down on him. And uh, I can't remember what it was. But, uh, you know, of course, Media Matters is an outfit that ha hassles conservatives in the media. And they managed to break into our server and get the email addresses of the students and the faculty and the staff and send everybody an email about how shameful it was that Hillsdale College would advertise on Rush Limbaugh. And, you know, we, that's a little inconvenient. And uh, didn't, it didn't cause much trouble, oddly enough. But uh, then I got a call from a journalist from the Huffington Post. And I took it and I said, what do you want? And he, she said, uh, are you gonna cancel your advertisements on Rush Limbaugh? And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. And she said, why not? And I said, because you're the one asking. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most serious things he ever said, he, he learned of that. And uh, one of the most, you know, he lost a couple of advertisers over that, window blinds or something. And, uh, he looked at me and he said, you know, that was very noble. And I said, why? And he said, uh, you didn't run away. And I said, you know, Rush, if I was, we were the kind of people to do that, would we have been here in the first place? You know, it's a crazy thing to do, but it was a good thing to do. Because um, it, how it works, right? We, we think we have some beautiful things to teach. We think they're world saving. We think they're soul saving, whether they serve the world or not. And we want to teach as many people as we can. That's in the original articles. All who wish, without regard to race, sex, or national origin. And that's what the college was in the Civil War days, when it was a very influential thing. And it's an influential thing again. And so we want to talk to a lot of people. And you know, we don't advertise on the Huffington Post because CNN is not a good field for us. And uh, because, why? Because it's not so much just that people are conservative, that helps. It's that they're conservative people who are interesting to know, interested to know serious things. And so, because of Rush Limbaugh, but because of all of the other things we do, I'm proud to have before me the best audience in America. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm uh, back on my Kathy Grammer task now. Rahim helped with that, didn't he? You feel better, Kathy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I have to say some bad stuff, and then you'll feel better after that. Um, Kathy likes for me, us, to manage her mood. <laughs> By the way, I don't think your grandchildren are as handsome as mine. What do you think? Wrong, wrong, yeah. We're not gonna reach agreement on that. Um, so here's the bad stuff. Uh, what has happened is revolutionary, and why it has happened is revolutionary and exceedingly dangerous. Uh, the what is, uh, the electoral system of the country is at least in part compromised. Uh, uh, and the electoral system is the fulcrum of everything. It's a, it's a simple relationship. Uh, we are the sovereign and we are outside the government. And the government has all the power to act. We don't do anything ourselves. We're not the legislature, we're not the executive, we don't judge. We elect people who do it. And that means, and when, when that, those arrangements were set up, they were sublimely effective. And Madison describes in another beautiful place in the Federalist Papers, the effect of that because Every human use of power should never be absolute or unchecked. And that includes even by us, the sovereign. So we can do anything we want to do, but it's going to take some time. And that means it's, we have to think before we act. In that mood, James Madison is like your mom. Think before you act, you know. All the rules, by the way, that are, are, are worth making, they're all stuff your mom and dad would have told you when you were a kid. And any other rules can never be remembered. Um, but so that's the thing, right? It, the first step in the Constitution is 
it delays our direct control of the government. And it's not that way in Athens, where the people got in an amphitheater and voted, and then next week got in an amphitheater and voted, voted something else. Uh, and it's not like the monarchies, where the king or queen is the executive branch. We're just the sovereign, and the government works for us, but it does all the work. Now, when those relationships were set up, they were amazingly stable for a long time until the Civil War, and then they were restored by the very great Abraham Lincoln. But that part of the reason for that was the government was about 10% of the economic activity in the country, eight or 10, and most of that was federal and local. The federal government was one or 2%. Well, now it's put it all together and it's pretty much a top-down system now, kind of unified. Uh, although not fully unified, which is an important strategic fact for the future. Um, it's now over 50%. So you wonder, why are all these Fortune 500 companies so politically correct? Partly the cause is their bosses all went to the best colleges, by which I mean the worst. And part of it is explained by the fact that the force that can stand up to them, if there is any in the world, is the government, and the government is staffed now by a major bureaucracy. The actual work of the American government is done by, in the, at the federal level, about two and a half million civilian employees. At the state level, 20-some million. But they all follow rules that are made inside the agencies, not laws anymore made in the Congress. So the point is, there's this system, and it's because it's so big, it's a mighty weight in the election process. And that's been a creeping problem, you know, a big problem and creeping bigger for decades now. And I've been railing against it. Well now, HR1, the first bill Nancy Pelosi has put in, is gonna put DC in the Senate, and it's going to impose a national system of vote harvesting. And that means this stuff that happens, right, where you don't know where the ballots come from. Lots of ballots. There's nothing wrong with lots of ballots. It's just something wrong with not knowing where they come from. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't know if Donald Trump won or not. I don't myself know. But I know that how Michigan was stolen, because I have the misfortune sometimes to live there. And that gets me to the cause. First of all, you know, and look at the thing. What are the things to, to mess with the electoral system? Ballot harvesting, D.C. statehood, a new interpret interpretation of voting rights. What voting rights, you know, that's the 15th Amendment. What was passed was everybody gets to vote. Well, that's much embellished now so that districts are arranged to figure out who wins on race and other identity group lines now. And so you could get a kind of a, uh, a nationally politically correct constituency. You know what, 19 or 20 million illegals about to be legal, probably by executive order, which is an interesting phenomenon because uh, one of the causes of the, of the Revolutionary War in the causes against the king in the Declaration of Independence is that he had expanded the territory of Quebec southwards. And he did that because he gave Quebec a new constitution and they didn't kick about it. And it was a constitution he liked where he could control it. And then he moved some American colonists into that Canadian colony. In other words, now it's not the people choosing the rulers, it's the rulers choosing the people. So that too, that illegal immigration stuff, that just reverses the relationship perfectly. And I think that's its object. Um, and then anybody tries to strike that down, the Supreme Court is living now under a threat of being packed. And that's exactly like the threat that Franklin Roosevelt made in 1936. And he probably would have done it, except the court changed his mind about all his programs and started authorizing them. So that means a massive political force 
which amounts to a rearrangement of the constitutional authority and the direction that power flows out rather than in, that is far advanced and may be complete, I don't know. I'll tell you what happened in Michigan. Um, we uh, know them, and uh, my general counsel has spent, uh, his hair's gray, he's been spending time with them. And he gives them advice for nothing. He doesn't act for them. Uh, he's also given advice, he just told me yesterday, the, the recalcitrant Spingler's restaurant in Jonesville, Michigan, six miles from the campus, has refused to close. And uh, Bob has been helping him out. And I told Bob, I said, that's controversial, please do it, but try to stay out of the paper. And then the next night, Mr. Spingler was on Fox News wearing a Hillsdale College sweatshirt. <laughs> and thanking Bob Norton for the help. Now, here's an interesting thing about presidential elections. Uh, the, to understand the constitutional system, it's, it, it is as much, it is both, it's two things. It is a system of concentrating power more than was possible under the Articles of Confederation. But also, it's an elaborate system of distributing power out across the land. So first of all, the federal government has a list of 17 things in Article 1, Section 8 that it's supposed to be able to do. States are not constrained that way. They can do whatever is in the police power, which is an old common law power to act for the general welfare. So the federal government is meant to be about certain things and supreme only on those. An interesting fact, by the way, is that education is not listed in those 17 things. Um, so the way elections run are radically decentralized. So the states control, and just they, they control their own elections, except now there are court cases and stuff that got the federal government intervening all the time. They control their own, but then for the federal elections, each house, the Senate and the House, get, is named to be the judge of the credentials, credentials of its own members. And that means if a state sends a, a rep and they think he's fraudulently elected, they can eject him and ask for another one. They can't name the other one, they can ask for another one. That rarely happens, but it does happen. Presidential elections. Now, that means, by the way, that laws were passed, they're old, in Michigan, and they're similar to the way the election laws work in America, and they're mostly pretty good. But they were passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. And that means that only another law passed by the legislature and signed by the governor could overturn it, except this summer. The Attorney General and the Secretary of State and the Governor began to negotiate changes in the election laws. Just the basic Michigan election laws. And they can't do that by themselves, but they did. And the legislature, a Republican majority, which increased in the last election in both houses, <laughs> did nothing. Uh, urged them to didn't. The presidential election is a special case because the, and there's a big debate about this in the Constitutional Convention, and of all of the provisions in the Constitution, this is one of the more clear. Because what they wanted was they wanted to generalize the process of selecting the president and distribute it all over the country. So the first idea was national popular vote. Uh, James Madison and Governor Clinton of New York, strange bedfellows. They didn't get along very much, mostly. Uh, that didn't go anywhere. So then they said the governors in the state should pick. But the trouble is there aren't very many governors. And so one could make deals to get something in exchange for his vote. So they argued that through. And then the next stage was state legislatures. They're numerous, enough of them that it's hard to make individual deals. Um, and then they added a refinement on top of that. And the refinement is exactly parallel to the ratification process where the Constitution was ratified by 
conventions by people elected on a ticket, yes or no, to the Constitution. And they served that one function and then they disappeared forever. Which is one of the reasons the Constitution is not constantly being amended. Well, this, they said, no, the legislators shall be in control of the manner of choosing electors. State legislatures, that means not the governor and not the courts, state legislatures have control of that. And the only time the federal government can intervene in that is if the states send conflicting slates of legislators. And that did not happen this time from any of the five Republican-controlled battleground states where they accepted the results. However, in most of those states, Michigan for sure, also Pennsylvania, also Wisconsin, probably the others, there are two more, they had watched their procedures being changed and not done anything about it. What uh, we thought they should do in the summer was uh, announce that they have sole control over the selection of the electors, and you're changing it. We reserve the right to pick our own slate. Now, that would have been a firestorm. All the national press, somebody who runs Google would have said something bad about them. And uh, the NBC News would be displeased, right? In other words, their life would be very intense because they actually have the power to do that. And to do it, when to do it, was August, before the ballots started coming in. And they didn't. And I, I think I know, I know them, many of them, I think I know why they didn't. Uh, it's something you learn if you go to the right college. What you are depends on how you live your life. And they needed to do two things that they didn't do. Because it's not just they neglected two things. These things would only come if they lived their lives in a certain way. First of all, they would need to know deeply their responsibilities and authorities. They take an oath to pursue them. You know, on the 1776 Commission, I took an oath to the Constitution. First time I've ever done it. And you know, I'm obliged to that now. It doesn't end because I got fired. Uh, you know, in the past I was that. This alone is denied even to God to make what has been not to have been. So, uh, and you know all this cancel stuff, by the way? It is just the most obvious truth in the world that that cannot be done. And that, that means, you know, I, I fear it because if they start doing it to me in their various ways they could, then, you know, I would have a world of turmoil. But I wouldn't have the fear that that could be ultimately successful. Because it happened, or it didn't. They didn't live their lives in a way to understand deeply things like the fact that they are in sole control of the manner of choosing the electors. What a tremendous responsibility. What a tremendous power. And they were unaware of it. One member of the leadership didn't know that the legislature had the subpoena power. Another one uh, opined that uh, the governor was the leader of the legislature. And uh, see, isn't that funny? Everybody knows. Everybody here knows better than that, right? And his argument was, well, she has the veto power, which basically gives her one third of the votes. She's the senior legislator. And so there then ensued a sophomore high school lesson in separation of powers. And you see, that, that person ran for office, got elected, is a good person with broadly correct political opinions according to my lights. He didn't know basic stuff, right? It's like a carpenter who doesn't know how to build with wood. And you know, the very best carpenters, they live their lives in a way so they get really good at that. And it takes a commitment, more than the normal, you see. And they haven't made that. And then the second thing is, uh, 
To do bold and courageous things, you have to practice. You have to practice in your mind. You know, that, that's uh, another word for that is worry. <laughs> you, uh, you know, you, you think I don't have, everybody who, everybody who works for me, every, all, all the vice presidents here, all the ones who are not here, we basically live our jobs. It's kind of weird. And we like each other and we love our jobs and we know how to relax, but uh, we practice all the time. What if they do this? What will we do? What if we do that? What will we do? Every big step we take is calculated uh, in, in light of its effects upon the dangers that might come upon, across upon the college. And that's why the college is the one independent one. We care about it. We give ourselves to it. We study it all the time. And then we think, how will we comport ourselves when terrible things happen to us? As they will, right? And you have to get your mind around that. And you have to get your mind around that in advance. If you want to see how that works, uh, in book two of Aristotle's Ethics, there's the riveting discussion of courage. And in there, he explains what makes a courageous act. And he says that if you want to see them, look at the battlefield, because there's a lot of them happen there. Because everybody has good reason to be afraid. And the point is, if you do that, if you think about that, what would I do, right? Then when it comes, it's not new to you. What would I do if the governor and the secretary of the state and the attorney general set out to alter the electoral laws, including the ones for the presidency, without consulting us? What if doing that, which they did, they also refused to answer any questions from us? What if the governor, in Michigan, we have two uh, emergency laws. And uh, I, I'm coming to think now that we passed bad laws right after great wars. One of them was passed in 1946. And it basically lets the governor declare an emergency and sustain it for a long time. Long, doesn't say when, it ends. And then in the 70s, they passed a, uh, a more sane emergency law, the more recent law then. And in the 70s, it says that she, she can declare an emergency. Within 30 days, she's got to go to the legislature and get them to agree. And then they can extend for 30 days, but every 30 days, she's got to talk to them. That's the way they work in all the good states, and that's most of the states, right? But no, she started out, by the way, when the pandemic hit, under the 1975 law, the one where she had to consult. And then she got her extension, and then they refused an extension, so she immediately went to the 1945 law, which proves, by the way, that she knew about the 1975 law. And they just, she just ran over them for months. And they, you know, and they sue her in the courts, right? What if instead they just didn't vote any money? She can't spend money without them appropriating it. They uh, did the other day, in an act of great boldness, uh, say that they're not going to uh, act on any of her appointments to commissions <laughs> if she doesn't straighten up. You know, and, and you know, I happen to know, as of two weeks ago, from election day until two weeks ago, the governor and the attorney general and the secretary of state had not answered a single question from the legislature, not in writing and not in verbally, right? And they won't come and testify. They just, they just uh, flout them. Now, we, what they should have got, if they'd just done this thing that we're gonna, cause see, she couldn't stop that. The Constitution is a very clever thing if you know how it works. She, they could send a second slate of electors to Washington because this slate wasn't chosen according to the law. And there's no power on earth that could stop them doing that. And all of the presidents say that when that happens, then the Senate has got to make it, the Senate and the House have got to make a decision. And they didn't do that. They didn't threaten it. And if they threatened it, or later done it, but threaten it would be way better, then they'd say, but I'll tell you what, if we can devise some procedures to make sure 
that these ballots are held in custody and protected and that everybody gets to vote and everybody gets to vote once and nobody gets to vote for them, right? And those requests would have had wide public support. They would have been operating during a firestorm, but the only way you're gonna survive that and get any change is if you use something that constitutes a real power. And they have a real power and that's what it's for. And they don't have an absolute power, that would be wrong. And the governor doesn't have an absolute power, that would be wrong and wrong for her to pretend that she does. So that means that first of all, it's very hard to know if the ballots were fair. We know that there were millions stored in warehouses. The location of only the, one of the warehouses is known. It was said once by the Secretary of State, the state there was nine of them scattered around the state. And the one that's known, neighbors report people went in and out all the time. What were they doing? You know, there weren't observers, there weren't, you know, as far as we know. So you see, what that means is, that's a raw assertion of power over the people, you see. And I must say, that was not pointed out by her opposition in the legislature. So, and that's what I say is the worst thing. I say that uh, we didn't stop this because we weren't ready to. And we weren't ready to because we don't live right. But that also turns to the, a good thing. And that is, isn't it true that if you get slaughtered, it's better if the fault is in you? Because then maybe you can do something about it. How are we doing, Kathy? You feeling better? Yeah, right? In other words, I mean, we don't have to be Abraham Lincoln. We just have to get better than these guys <laughs> to do better. And, and so I actually take heart from that. Although this is a power grab of the very first order. And where's it gonna go? I'll say my last gloomy thing. Did I tell you about this Spanish professor I hired? Did I talk about that last night? It's my favorite subject right now. There's a guy named Carano, and he's going to teach Spanish at Hillsdale College. And, you know, if you, if you apply for a job at Hillsdale College, you won't be applying for a better job, because there isn't one. Because it's got all the features, right? Everybody's smart, everybody works, everybody's nice to each other. The kids are naughty in just the right amount. Um, or sometimes a little more. But uh, this guy was a full professor in his 40s at Venezuela and a prominent academic figure there. And he had to run for his life. He, 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 he left his property behind. He left his job behind. And he got to America because they were inflating his salary around away and he lived under constant threat about whatever he might say. And so now he's here and he needs a job because he can't stay if he doesn't get a really good job. It has to be a permanent job to look right on the visa. So what it effectively means is he needs this job. And there are two others who are also very good and I drew all that out of him. I, I get him to tell me, I, I try to find out what do they love. You can always predict people's behavior if you know what they love. And so I got into all that and he told me all about it. And of course my heart went out to him. And I said, you know, I don't know if you're gonna get this job or not. And see, I have the power to give it to him by myself, but I don't do that because my colleagues are so good and they have more time to think about it than I do. And so I do overrule them once in a while, but not often. And never before I find out what they're gonna do, anyway. I said, I don't know what's gonna happen, but uh, I'll make you a promise. I've been running a one-man immigration service for 40 years. If I see somebody really worthy, I try to help them become a citizen of the United States. I will do that for you. And he cried in my office, right? And my point is, that's what it's like when your country sinks into despotism. It is not a happy thing. 
So we have to stop that. How? My last point. Come to find out, I know a little bit about Winston Churchill. And uh, he, he is just the man for right now. What happened to him in his life? He has spent his life foreseeing and trying to prevent the great world wars. Instead, it was his fate to fight them. He spent his life warning about socialism. In the warnings, he said, uh, it'll, it'll end the freedom of the British people. It will also end our ability to feed ourselves. There'll be a collapse. We'll have to depopulate partly the island. Those kind of warnings all his life, beginning in 1898 when he was 26 years old and continuing right through to his death in 65. But in the 1945 election, they just simply swept the socialists for the first time. They beat him or his party, the war hero, right? And he was devastated. Do you see? He's in exactly our position except worse. Because I've been warning about all this all my life, warning that they're going to rig, rig the electoral system so you can't get them out. All, and now it's happened, right, probably. And I think about him. And see, he had laid the ground. He was also, how old was he, 45, 26. So he was 60, 72. He, uh, you know, he'd won glory. Everybody thought he was the greatest man in the world, even his enemies. And so, of course, the reliable times of London, worse now, but bad then, they called it's time for him to retire. He can be the great world statesman, which he did become, by the way. But uh, now the Conservative Party needs new blood. And the Socialists are going to get their chance. And, you know, he was devastated by that election. It took him two or three weeks to get his dauber up. And then he says, uh, I stay till the pub closes and I fight for my corner. And then he launched a whole strategy, and it's the one we have to launch today. He said, we've been warning about these things that they're going to do for decades. Now they're going to do them. Now they will be visible beyond mistake. And so we are going to oppose them. We're going to call out what they do. We're going to use that to persuade the people that we have to change. Now, it took seven years, because they'd won a huge majority and he couldn't get them out, but he beat them soon. And then he gets to be prime minister again. And I'll, I'll give you one of his arguments. This is the very best. Um, and you know, it's hard, by the way, to get arguments out these days, because social media and all that. But the truth is, the alternatives are also easy and cheap and you know, they don't, they don't have a monopoly on the internet. Uh, here's a great thing. Do you, you know about uh, the browser Brave? Yeah, get that, yeah. And they've done something that I think is really awesome. Uh, there's a protocol. I'm about to get be a techie here for a minute. There's a protocol called, called uh, Interplanetary File System. IPFS, <laughs> and the guy who, who uh, invented it is from Stanford, he's a young guy, and you can find on YouTube him giving a talk about it at Stanford, and this file system is incorporated into the Brave browser now. Now here's what it does. Uh, the way the internet works is, uh, to find any piece of information on it, you, you find the domain where it is, and then you find the thing in the domain. And it's the fact that, the, that you get to all the files through a particular domain that lets Facebook own everything on it, for example. Whereas what this does is it replicates the file around the internet in various places, and the file address is just to the file. And he says, because he's not stupid, this guy, he's very smart, he's a nerdy kind of engineer guy, but what he says is, that will make the internet freer and harder to censor. 
And it doesn't take infrastructure. So uh, right now, uh, you know, these huge server farms that, you know, they're, you know they, they deal with half a continent. Well, those belong to about five companies. If you distribute this way, you can just go through and around them both. Now, it's an interesting thing to me, because that guy gave a very clever talk, you know, because he's dealing with things that are very sensitive, like Google, the big, the big gorilla, throwing off Parler and throwing off Trump and throwing off everybody, right? And, and Amazon doing the same and all of them, and Apple doing the same. Those guys are bad. And, uh, and he is giving a talk about how you could get around that. And he does it very gently. I think he ought to go into politics. But you, but you can tell what he's saying. And then our commencement speaker is Tim Allen this year. Yeah. I said to him, uh, Mr. Allen, you're the most requested commencement speaker after Clarence Thomas. And he said, Clarence Thomas? I can kick his ass. <laughs> Commencement's going to be fun this year. But he says he knows a bunch of people who are big up in the tech world and that they are very disturbed by what's going on in there and they want to find a way out of it. Now that brings me, that's Churchill's point, right? His point is they're going to do these things now and they will be less able to pretend that they're not what they seem. And people will be persuaded. Or else, by the way, the American people are ready to be despotized. And that means we're the walking dead already. But I don't think that. And I'm just going to close with this. This is one of the prettiest things about Winston Churchill. I had a lifelong friend, Violet Bonham Carter, beautiful woman, grandmother of Helena Bonham Carter, the actress. And they were sweet on each other for a little while when they were young. And it was before Churchill figured out how to court a woman. So he would take her out and they'd memorize noble speeches and poems. <laughs> That's, he got better when Clemmy came along. But he, he, he memorized with Violet the poem I'm going to read to you. And that was in 1904, 1903. Got married in 1908. But now it's April 27th, 1941. And Britain is alone. Russia and Germany are together. America is aloof. Overwhelming power being brought to bear on the island. And, you know, two months later it would change because Hitler attacked uh, Stalin then. That was a strategic mistake he made, but left us with the Cold War afterwards. And so in this darkest, it's the lowest point right now. He recites this poem on the radio. This is by Arthur Hugh Clough. Say not the struggle not availeth, the labor and the wounds are vain. The enemy faints not nor faileth, and as things have been, they remain. If hopes were dupes, fears may be liars. It may be in the smoke concealed. Your comrades chase even now the flyers, and but for you possess the field. I'll interrupt to say, when you're in a fight, the pattern is always the same at the beginning. There's an, a number of the enemy, and then there's a larger number, and then there's a larger number. That's always how it starts, right? And of course, of course, the mind, full fear, of course, imagines that the number is infinite. But what this poem is about is, we don't know the number. We can only hope, and we must hope. He goes on. For while the tired waves vainly breaking, Seem here no painful inch to gain. Far back through creeks and inlets making, comes silent, flooding in the main. And not by eastern windows only, when daylight comes, comes in the light. In front, the sun climbs slow, how slowly. But westward, look, the land is bright. 
That was an appeal to us in the West, right? Uh, after he finished that, he called Violet Bottom Carter. He didn't talk to her all that much at that time. And you know, he was a very great man and she was an old woman. And he got her on the phone and she, Violet, and she was bawling. And he said, did you hear our poem? I'll close with this. That's our poem too. <laughs>